Stripping down science. The Naked Scientists. Hello, it is Sunday, October the 31st. Welcome to The Naked Scientist. I'm Chris Smith. This week, we're taking on your science questions, including finding out what happens if you shine a laser beam through a magnifying glass. Do you get some kind of super laser as a result? Plus, we've got news that we're very unlikely to be alone in the universe. A new study suggests that as many as one in four stars resembling our own sun is likely to have an Earth-sized planet orbiting it. That's all on the way. Also joining us this week on the programme, because it is National Pathology Week, is pathologist Dr Susie Lishman. Hello, Susie. Good evening, Chris. Uh, she'll be answering your pathology questions. And uh, also with us this week is our kitchen science king. That's Dave Ansel. Hi, Dave. Hello. Um, this week I've got a great trick for you to try at home, which will enable you to see the information which is actually stored on your credit card. I'll explain how you can do it later in the programme. Might come in handy if you've got someone who's a bit of a spender freak on your credit card. Maybe not, I don't know, but I'm intrigued all the same. Thank you, Dave. If you've got any science questions, we would love to hear from you. You can tweet at Naked Scientists or you can write on our Facebook page. That's at thenakedscientist.com forward slash Facebook. We've put a special link there. Or you can drop us an email. The email address is chris at thenakedscientist.com. The Naked Scientist podcast is powered by UK Fast, the UK's best hosting provider. On the web at ukfast.co.uk. This is The Naked Scientist with Chris Smith and with Dave Ansell. And first up, let's take a look at what's been happening, scientifically speaking, around the world this week. Dave, what have you got for us? Scientists have come up with a new washing machine resistant coat. Now, waterproof clothing has been getting a lot more comfortable over the last 20 years with the invention of various breathable fabrics. I'm glad scientists are working on important things. <laughs> it makes my life an awful lot more comfortable when walking up in the hills. I don't know about anything else. One common strategy is to make the fabric a very water repellent or hydrophobic. This means that despite the fact that it's covered in holes, so water vapour from sweat can escape, water droplets can't get through because they're bigger than the holes. The bigger the holes, the more breathable the fabric is. But so I get it. So Sorry to interrupt, but what you're saying is that if you've got a fabric with lots of little holes, water vapour, which is molecules, can go through. But because literally bubbles of water droplets are big and they're sticky, they're not able to break up to become small enough to go the wrong way through the holes. Yeah, if the fabric is repelling the water. But that's, that's not new. I mean, Gore-Tex and things like that have been around for years that work like that, haven't they? That's right, but they're quite water repellent. But um, new materials have been coming up recently which are called super hydrophobic. These are really, really water repellent. Um, I've seen videos of this. You can get a droplet of water and drop a droplet of water on the surface and it actually bounces. It doesn't wet, it doesn't stick, it just bounces off the surface. The problem is that these super hydrophobic coatings are normally quite um, fragile. So you might have a beautifully waterproof coat um, one day, with, which is incredibly breathable, but as soon as you put it in the washing machine, it loses all of its properties. But Bo Deng and colleagues at the Shanghai Institute of Applied Physics have been working on this. Um, they've taken a commercially available super hydrophobic coating, essentially a heavily fluorinated ac acrylate polymer. Instead of adding some kind of catalyst to cause the acrylate monomer to join up and form a big long chain molecule called a polymer, they irradiated cotton soaked in the solution of this monomer with gamma rays and sometimes the gamma ray will hit the cotton and this will cause some damage to the cotton at which point monomer can come and stick onto that cotton and then it can start growing a polymer actually physically covalently attached oh, the cotton, to the that's polymer. clever so rather than making a sheet which you would then have a sheet of the hydrophobic material which you then glue onto the cotton and that's obviously weak because the two can separate and break up in the way you say you're actually coming up with a chemical strategy to glue the monomer molecules onto the cotton in certain places, literally fix them on, and then new polymers can grow from there attached physically to the cotton. Yeah, that's right. And so they're very, very, very resilient. They've washed these things 250 times with actually stainless steel balls in the washing machine just to make it a little bit more challenging. And the property seems to be still there after 250 washes. So as long as you're going somewhere really wet, <laughs> this will be great. But no, I mean, joking aside, why will this be helpful or useful? Why is this better than the wet weather gear we've got if you want to go walking in the mountains at the moment? Well, especially if you're walking somewhere very, very hot, making it more breathable makes your life a lot more pleasant. And so, you, in fact, you could probably even make things like a shirt fairly waterproof so you wouldn't actually necessarily have to carry a second coat. And also they've suggested it would be really useful in flotation devices, things like life jackets. Because it's so water repellent, um, the water just can't get into this a big mass of kind of insulation or buoyancy. 
and so even if the sort of stuff around the outside of the um, boy, life jacket is broken um, it still it gives you quite a lot of flotation or you could just like people like fishermen who can't wear life jackets because they're dangerous because they can get caught in gear can just wear a shirt made out of this stuff and it still gives them quite a lot of flotation Terrific, thank you um, Near to production, easily produced? I think probably at present using gamma rays is going to cause all sorts of hideous um, kind of legislative problems to actually produce this thing in mass production so the chemists are going to have to come up with a different way of doing it but it's very very promising all a the good same. proof of principle Dave thanks well actually this week it is National Pathology Week and all over the country there are going to be people who are trying to show the public what pathologists do in labs and it's not just about dead bodies um, it's also about actually bringing the science of pathology into the public domain so that people can appreciate how pathologists diagnose disease, do tests and that kind of thing. One thing that pathologists routinely end up diagnosing is cancer. And uh, actually one type of cancer, pancreatic cancer, is quite common. It's a cancer that many of us will have heard about because the actor Patrick Swayze died of it in 2005. And the thing about pancreatic cancer is that it usually presents very late. In other words, people by the time they're diagnosed with it often have almost end-stage disease and the survival five years later is really grim. Only about 5 to 10% of people actually go on after about five years. So why, does it, why is it so hard to detect it? Well, probably because the primary cancer develops in a hollow part of the body. The pancreas is in your peritoneal cavity and there's lots of space there. So lesions, big tumours, can actually get really quite large before they begin to press on things or obstruct things or make themselves known in other ways. So as a result, they can become really quite well developed and then have spread around the body, usually, by the time they're picked up. So researchers really want to get to grips with what actually is the succession? How do these cancers arise genetically? And how long do they take to manifest in the first place? Is there a time when we could detect them early and then intervene? And there's a paper in the journal Nature this week by Christine Yacobuzio Donahue, who's at Johns Hopkins. And what she and her colleagues did were rapid autopsies on seven patients who had died of pancreatic cancer. And what that meant was they could go into the patients and get almost fresh cancer cells from the pancreas itself from the cancer but also from the metastases the deposits of spread around the body and they could then get dna out of those tissue samples and then do what they call produce an evolutionary tree genetically for the genetic changes that make the cancer happen because cancers occur because of damage to dna so were they getting the tree by looking at different cancers in different places and looking at the differences? That's right. So you sequence through the DNA. This tells you what DNA changes have occurred both in the primary tumour and then in other bits of the primary tumour and then in other metastases around the body. And you can use this like a timeline to work out which bit of the primary tumour and when, in terms of acquiring these changes, spawned off these different metastases. And because we know the rate at which genetic changes occur, in other words, how quickly mutations crop up, it's possible to work out how long someone must have had a cancer for before it produced these metastases and then before it in turn killed the patient. The numbers are really quite staggering. Would you believe actually that most of the people in this study, the seven patients, had had cancer for at least 20 years? which is surprising, isn't it? They found that it takes about 11 and a half to 12 years for an initial set of genetic changes to then turn into a primary cancer inside the pancreas somewhere, and then a further seven years before that primary cancer actually becomes cancerous in the sense that it can begin to spread around the body. But then after that happens, only about two or three years before the person unfortunately dies. In other words, the cancer is there for a very long time, and if we could find a way of detecting it early by going in looking for blood tests and things like that, there's every possibility. If you could pick it up early, you could arrest it before it got to the stage where it would begin to spread, and you could turn that very grim 5 to 10% five-year survival into a 95% survival. Fascinating. Now, also this week, uh, we have uh, heard good news that we may not be alone, or at least not so lonely, in the universe as we may be first thought, because researchers in America have announced that as many as 23% of stars like our Sun could have Earth-sized planets orbiting around them. And to explain how they came to this figure and what it means for the search for other worlds, a bit like our own, we're joined now by Dr Andrew Howard, who's at the University of California at Berkeley. Hello, Andrew. Hello. Andrew, tell us first of all, how did you actually do this study? So we used the Keck telescope in Hawaii, and essentially what we did was conduct a census of the planets orbiting the stars nearest to our own solar system. 
And so we looked at each one of the 166 stars night after night for almost five years. We didn't look at them every single night. Um, but we were able to detect the most massive planets, those planets that are uh, even bigger than Jupiter, as well as less massive planets, those planets that were down to a mass of about three times the mass of the Earth. So we covered this enormous mass range from three Earth masses all the way up to a 1,000 Earth masses. And we can't quite detect the Earth, which we'd really like to, but we can extrapolate their numbers based on a really clear trend that we see from having relatively few planets at the high mass end. We see only about one or two Jupiters per 100 stars in our survey. Um, down at the low mass end, we see a lot more planets. At, in the, the 3 to 10 Earth mass range, we see something like 12 planets per 100 stars. And so if you just extrapolate this trend that we, that we see over a very large mass range down to one Earth mass planets, we estimate that about 23% of stars like the Sun have a relatively close-in planet like the Earth. That's a big number, isn't it? 23 is a really big number. This, is, this number has sometimes been called Eta sub-Earth for the Greek character Eta. This is a, a term that's appeared in Frank Drake's equation that's used to estimate the prospects for, for SETI. And Eta sub-Earth had remained kind of a mystery. People always wanted to know, are Earth-like planets common or are they rare? And some people estimated that it was 100%. Some people estimated that it was one in a million. We say 23% or about one in four. And to be fair, we had a little bit of an extrapolation here, and I wouldn't be surprised if the true number is one in two or maybe one in eight, but it's not one in a hundred, and that's a really big improvement in our knowledge. If we could visit some of these distant worlds, what would they be like? What's the prospects that they're in the same position relative to their star that our Earth is, and therefore have the kinds of conditions that this planet does? In other words, it's not too hot, not too cold, we've got liquid water. The technique we use is the Doppler method, sometimes called the wobble method, and it turns out that we're most sensitive to planets that are really close to their host stars. So we were only able to detect planets out to a quarter of the Earth's sun distance. So at that really close orbital distance, if you put the planets inside the solar system, they'd be inside the orbit of Mercury. These are really hot planets. I really seriously doubt that there's life on these specific planets. But what they tell us is that nature makes small planets commonly and deposits them at close orbital distances. And it seems reasonable to suppose that if there are planets at close orbital distances, there are probably planets a little farther out where the radiation from the sun isn't so intense and these planets might be in the so-called Goldilocks zone or the habitable zone of planets where the temperature is not too hot, not too cold, it's just right for liquid water and perhaps for life to evolve. How does this finding sit with our understanding of how systems like our own do put themselves together and evolve in the first place? It's really interesting. The, the so-called theories of planet formation, there's this, a dominant paradigm which is called the core accretion model. And this is a, a model that's been longstanding, and it predicts that most planets in, in all solar systems are born in the outer, the cool outer reaches that are far from the host star. And the main reason is because to efficiently make the core of a planet, you need ice. And to have ice, you have to be in a cool part of the solar system that is far from the host star. And so this model predicts that most planets are born out there. Some of them grow up to be quite large, the size of Saturn's and Jupiter's, and some do not. Some are a whole range of sizes, from smaller than the Earth to Earth size to a little bit bigger. But the theory also predicts that it's basically only the largest planets, the gas giants like Saturn and Jupiter, that migrate close to their host star. So this theory made a prediction for our observations, and they predicted that, that we would only detect large close-in planets, and we shouldn't detect very many small close-in planets. And they actually had a name for this. The theorists called this the planet desert. They predicted there'd be almost no close-in small planets. But instead and you've detected an oasis there, haven't you? You've got a, you've got yeah, a whole lot of them. One in four of them's got a, small planets. It's a tropical rainforest. It's the opposite <laughs> of a desert. So. I think there's the the whole theory of planet formation by core accretion. I don't think it needs to be thrown out, but I think that in particular this migration part of it is not right and it needs to be revised. Andrew, thank you for joining us to explain that. That was Andrew Howard. He's from the University of California at Berkeley. He's published that study this week in the journal Science and we'll put more details of that on our website at thenakedscientist.com forward slash news for you to follow up and read a bit more. Dave? Now... 
um, scientists have developed a new kind of transistor. Now, almost all of analogue electronics, from cassette players um, to the radio parts of your mobile phone, are based around transistor amplifiers. These are circuits based on transistors, which will take an input signal and amplify the voltage or the current to produce a much larger output. There are two major types of amplifier. Positive gains, where if you increase the input, the output will increase. And negative gain, where if you increase the input, the output decreases. They both involve different physical types of transistor. So if you want an amplifier to do both, the circuit you need gets much more complicated. Because you've got to have two bits of kit. Yeah, and then you need somewhere switching between the two of them and everything gets a lot more complicated. Now, Zhu Bai Yang and colleagues from Rice University in Houston have been working on transistors in graphene. This is an incredibly promising material for electronics made up of a single layer of carbon, a single layer of graphite. Got the Nobel Prize this year for uh, yep. graphene chemistry, didn't it? Uh, Andre Geim at the University of Manchester got a Nobel Prize for his, his graphene work off the back of having levitated a frog in a magnetic field, which was his initial uh, claim to fame. I'm not sure they were exactly necessarily related, but certainly the graphene is very, could be very, very important. Now, the transistors they've built change their behaviour entirely depending on the bias voltage you apply to them, changing from positive gain to negative gain through an intermediate um, regime where they can double the frequency of the input. This could possibly produce smaller, cheaper and possibly more power-efficient mobile phones and other radio devices. And as it's made of graphene, which has very, very good high-frequency properties, they could work a lot faster than the present equivalent. Any time soon that we'll be seeing this technology? Um, I think probably the big hold-up is finding a way of mass-producing graphene, which certainly isn't... It shouldn't be too difficult. It's a lot simpler than mass-producing systems made of carbon nanotubes and things like that. But it's not bog-standard yet, so they're going to have to develop the technology to do that before they can start implementing these transistors. So it could take a few years. So making your better PC chips and that kind of thing is not yet a PC of cake, is it? I don't think it's ever been a piece of cake. <laughs> Boom. Thank you, Dave. Now, lastly this week... There's new insights into how the brain focuses attention on things. Now, it's been a long-standing question. Here we are in a room. We're being assailed by sensory information all the time. There's visual information coming in. There's thermal information, how warm or cold you feel. There's the sensation of the clothes against your skin and all this kind of thing. But how do we focus our attention on just a fraction of that sensory information and zone out all of the rest? really hard to know because to do that you need to do really quite invasive brain experiments which are often not ethical or permissible on humans but occasionally an opportunity presents itself and there's a group of researchers led by Moran Surf who's at Caltech in America and they have done this very study on 12 patients who were undergoing studies to work out why they had epilepsy because in some people the only way to treat epilepsy is to find out which bit of the brain is misbehaving and you do that by implanting electrodes into the brain tissue to to then register the brain activity and then you can in- inactivate or burn out the small bit of the brain which is misbehaving and this cures the epilepsy. So what this group did was to team up with the doctors who had put these electrodes into these 12 epileptic patients into the middle part of their brain and they asked the patients to look at some photographs and they showed them a whole range of different photographs, over 100 different pictures of familiar people, famous people like Bill Clinton, Marilyn Monroe, fruits and vegetables, buildings, all that kind of thing. And the idea was they were looking for an electrode, in other words, corresponding to one or two, just a small clutch of nerve cells that only fired off when it saw a specific picture because they were interested in recording from the part of the brain that that deals with memory. So this was just by sort of fluke that it happened to be in the right place to triggered by that picture. Yeah, so there's an electrode which happens by sheer fluke to correspond to a group of neurons that register that particular thing that that bit of the brain is interested in. So they flash up when that picture comes up. And what they then did, once they'd identified four such electrodes that corresponded to four independent pictures, they said to the subjects, right, we're going to put you in front of a computer screen. We are going to show you a montage of two pictures each time. One of the pictures is going to be transparently superimposed in front of the other one, so you can see both, but they're sort of greyed out. And by thinking about one of them, the computer will make the picture you're thinking about become more opaque and the other one will fade away. Just try and do this by thinking by whatever strategy you want about the picture that we tell you we want you to think about. So say they flashed up a picture of Marilyn Monroe superimposed on Bill Clinton. The subjects would then think Bill Clinton, Bill Clinton, Bill Clinton, and they could actually make the computer, by recording the activity coming off these electrodes, grey out the picture of Marilyn Monroe and bring Bill Clinton into the foreground. And they did this with 69% success every single time, within just half an hour of being plugged into the system. And so this enabled them then to ask the question, right, how does the brain 
focus its attention on what it wants to look at. And the way they got to that was to say, right, when they asked them to think about Bill Clinton, did the brain then increase the signal about Bill Clinton from those neurons, or did it suppress the activity about Marilyn Monroe or the other things? And it was the latter. The brain seems to focus your attention by suppressing activity about distracting things and therefore leaving the signal pure for the thing that you're most interested in. So this is really the first time we've got, the, got to grips with how the brain shifts your attention and focuses on things. And it could also be useful as a means of enabling people who are paralysed, for example, to control computers because it's the first time anyone's done anything quite this ambitious and quite so simply too. Brilliant. Dave, thank you. This is The Naked Scientist. It's Chris Smith, Dave Ansell, and our special guest this week, Susie Lishman, and we're answering all your science questions. Coming up, we'll find out uh, actually how you can stop frost forming on your car. Luke wants to talk about that. And also what happens when you spread Vaseline on your wounds. How do they heal up afterwards? Keeping you abreast of the world's best science. The Naked Scientists. This is The Naked Scientist. It's Chris Smith, Dave Ansell and Susie Lishman. Let's go straight over to Luke Collins, who's got a carport-related question. Hello, Luke. Hello. What would you like to talk about? Well, the seasons are changing, and now I notice that when I go out into my apartment parking lot, there's frost on the windows of all the cars in the morning. But my parking lot also has uh, carports for people who want to pay extra to rent them, and I've noticed that none of the cars in the carport have frost on the windows, even though the carports are unheated and, other than a roof, exposed to the air. And I wondered why that is. OK, to understand this, you've to understand, first of all, what is frost and how is it happening? Basically what happens is at night, especially if there's a clear sky at night, anything which is warm radiates heat. Um, you're radiating heat all the time. That's the thing which the heat cameras you sometimes see on police um, films on the TV are seeing when people glow really brightly, that's because they're warmer. They're radiating more infrared heat. So basically the warmer something is, the more heat it loses. Now if you're inside a house, um, you're losing heat all the time, but so are the walls. So you're heated up by the heat coming off the walls and it's heated up by you. So you don't feel that cold. So you're actually getting quite a lot of energy beamed into you from the walls of the house. But if you go outside on a cold, clear night, um, you're basically just seeing the, the sky. And the sc temperature of um, deep space is about 2.9 degrees above absolute zero. It's about minus 270 degrees centigrade. So that's really, really cold. So basically there's no heat coming down onto you. And so you're just radiating heat and you lose heat very quickly. And the same thing happens to the ground. The ground loses heat very quickly. It cools down. And then once it gets below the frost point of the air, so that um, water starts condensing out of the air onto it, you start forming frost. And then eventually, basically, all the water is condensed out of the air and it's very dry and there's nothing more left. Whereas under a carport, the top of the roof will cool down quite a lot, um, but probably down to slightly below zero, but that's still a lot, lot warmer than the sky. So the roof is still radiating some heat down onto the ground inside the carport, so that's kept slightly warmer than everything else. So all of the moisture tends to condense everywhere else rather than inside the carport. So even if it did get, by the end of the night, it gets down to below zero, every, all the water's already condensed everywhere else. So there's no frost inside the carport. And I would add that perhaps the water which is going to condense is going to come down out of the sky, and if there is a physical barrier there, then it's likely to settle on that roof more than on the car underneath the roof, and therefore there isn't anything to freeze on the glass so even though the glass is very very cold anyway you're, you're going to end up with a, a clear windscreen rather than a frosty one i think it's more to do with the temperature than actual movements of water indeed thank you dave karen hello yes hi chris how are you i'm very well what would you like to talk about something that's really puzzled me a little bit is the observation of our planets um earth the moon the sun and the stars they all seem to be in a very distinguished shape um sort of being of a circle quite a perfect shape Yet meteorites, if we see any of them hurtling through space, they seem very distinguishedly irregular. Um, why would that be that you know, most of the planets are in that circular shape? Obviously not a complete circle. But close enough. Indeed. Yes, well, the reason is if you look at things from a long way away, like the sun, like the earth, like Mars, yes, they do look like big circles in the sky, that's true. If you zoomed in a bit closer, you'd see that actually the surfaces are quite lumpy and bumpy. The earth has mountains and volcanoes and so does Mars. So the surface isn't completely smooth, but yes, they have been pulled into a circular shape. Whereas smaller objects, like the things in the asteroid belt, can be an irregular shape. What's different between the things in the asteroid belt and big planets like the Earth and even big blobs of gas like the Sun 
is that the Earth, Mars and the Sun are very big, therefore they have enormous amounts of mass and therefore they have an enormous amount of gravity. And what that gravity is doing is pulling all of the particles together. And the way in which the particles can arrange themselves so they are as close as they can be to each other is into a spherical shape. It gives you the best surface area to volume ratio, if you like. So in other words, everything is as surrounded by everything else and pulling towards everything else as tightly as it can. A smaller object, like an asteroid, doesn't have the same mass, it's much smaller, and they're much, therefore, more loosely bound together. And there isn't the gravity to pull the material together into a spherical shape. If you kept adding material, then it would accrete slowly to make a planet. And in fact, the asteroid belt is a failed planet. It's rubble left over from planet building, probably because there wasn't sufficient gravity there to pull a planet together and hold it together up against the gravitational tugs of all of the other planets forming in the solar system. So that's really the reason. Thank you very much for the question. That's Karen Page. If you'd like to get in touch on Twitter, you tweet at Naked Scientists. You can use our Facebook page, and we've put a special link to help you. You go to nakedscientist.com forward slash Facebook, and it will take you to our Facebook page, or you can email us. It's chris at thenakedscientists.com. Coming up in just a second, Daniel is on the phone. He wants to talk about wounds and Vaseline, but the person he wants to talk to is Susie. So let me introduce Dr Susie Lishman, who's with us as our special guest this week. Hello, Susie. Hi, Chris. Thank you for coming in to talk to us on The Naked Scientist this week. It is National Pathology Week, so tell us what that's all about. Well, this is the third time that the Royal College of Pathologists has organised this week, and the idea is that we highlight the role that pathologists and scientists play in keeping people healthy. When people think of pathology, they often think of things like CSI and silent witness and dead bodies, but actually dealing with dead people is a very tiny part of what pathologists do, and the vast majority of their time is spent helping the living. So this week there'll be over 500 events taking place all around the country, so people can go along to laboratory open days and have a look behind the scenes, there'll be schools visits, art competitions, interactive workshops, quizzes, a whole range of things happening to highlight what pathology is all about. It's all free and the idea is to try to tell people really what this hidden art is all about. As you say, many people think pathologists are all about dead bodies, but it's far more than that. We've got a question here, which is one person said, you know, how do I actually get into pathology? Jay Winter said, how do I actually get get into the art of, of studying pathology? Yes, well, to be a pathologist, you need to do a medical degree first. So after getting good GCSEs and A-levels, hopefully get into medical school, which is getting harder to do year by year. And then you'll spend three or six years as a medical student, followed by two years of foundation training that all doctors do before they start to specialise. Then you can apply to a specialist training programme, which is a minimum of five years. So we're looking at probably 12 years or so from deciding to go to medical school to actually get into the end of your pathology training. And many people actually take time out along that time to do some extra research, perhaps a PhD or specialise in something. So it can take even longer. When I tell people I'm still taking exams at the age of 35, having just I've finally finished them, I think I've taken my last exam well now, but who knows, <laughs> uh, they're normally quite gobsmacked. Would you mind uh, answering this question for Daniel, Susie? Daniel, hello. Hello, how are you? Susie's here. What would you like to ask her about? Uh, I would like to ask, uh, basically, how do wounds heal, like when you apply petroleum jelly or neosporin into the wound? I know, you know, on the microscopic level, there are molecules of that uh, foreign material that would actually be inside your wound. I was kind of wondering how the body proceeds to heal. Does it actually go through the uh, foreign material, or does it go around it, or is, at that point is it already maybe evaporated out of the wound? I was kind of wondering. Thanks, Daniel. It's a, a good question. I think the first thing to say is that pe- the petroleum jelly itself has no medicinal effect and it doesn't actually affect whether a blister forms and it's not absorbed so it doesn't get absorbed into the wound but its effectiveness in wound healing is related to its sealing effect on cuts and burns so what it does it stops germs getting into the wound so it doesn't get infected so it can heal more quickly it also keeps the area supple it prevents the skin's moisture from evaporating so it stays nice and moist and supple and it enables that area to heal without cracking The really important thing about putting petroleum jelly on uh, burns, for example, is that you mustn't put it on a fresh burn because burns continue to damage the surrounding skin for some time because the heat continues after the initial burn occurs. And if you put Vaseline over the top of that, then it will actually trap the heat in and more damage will be done to the underlying skin. So it's essential that you wait until the burn has completely cooled down before sealing it. And the other interesting thing about uh, the way wounds heal that's been discovered fairly recently, is they actually create an electric current into the wound, which was researchers in Aberdeen started measuring this. They put a wire in the 
root of a wound and a wire on the edge of the wound and they could measure an electrical voltage difference between the two and the cells flow down the potential difference so they can sense the voltage and they move into the base of the wound from the margin of the wound where it's healing up and because they're blebbing off from the side if you do put a layer of, of petroleum jelly over the top they're just going to go underneath it aren't they Susie? Yeah they are they're not bothered whether it's there it just gets in the way they go around the, around the edge of it so uh, it doesn't actually have much effect on the wound healing itself it just enables it to happen. So they basically know where they've got to go and they go there. That's right. Thank you. Dave, here's one for you. Joshua Hill says, can lasers be concentrated with lenses? I love this, the idea that you could beam a laser beam into a magnifying glass and make a super powerful laser. I don't think it's quite going to work like that, though, is it? Well, the the simple answer is yes. Um, It's done all the time. Um, Virtually any laser which you've seen cutting anything will have been focused with a lens. So, in fact, the beautiful thing about laser light is it's far more focusable than ordinary light. It essentially behaves as if it was coming from a very, very, very small point source, so you can focus it very, 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 very tight, and it works beautifully. Focusing multiple lasers into the same beam, which I think was part of the things he was talking about, is much more difficult. You can focus lots and lots of different lasers into the same place, so you can sort of get lots of crossing focus laser beams into a single point. Um, which is what certainly American, uh, the American government's trying to do for nuclear fusion things. They put little tiny pellets of um, hydro- frozen hydrogen deuterium into the focus of these big, huge, hugely powerful lasers. That then compresses it so much that it can actually get so hot, far hotter than the centre of the sun, that it will then start the hydrogen atoms start fusing to form helium, and you can produce an immense amount of energy that way, and they're trying to get energy out of it. But actually focusing two laser beams exactly on top of each other is almost impossible. Dave, thank you. Michael uh, Rogavsky is on the line, and he's asking a very similar question to someone who is actually from Norway, and it's about caesareans. Hello, Michael. Hi, hi, Chris. Uh, in a recent show, you explained that a baby populates its intestinal flora by swallowing the muck it encounters while passing through the birth canal. A few hours after listening to the show on a podcast, uh, it occurred to me, I wondered, what, what happens when a baby is born by caesarean section? Is the flora as good as it would have obtained by normal vaginal delivery? Yeah, because when a baby comes out the normal way, I said quite appealingly the baby's first taste of life is a mouthful of muck, which which is its mum's muck. Those are bacteria which have colonised mum and have become optimised both to her genetically and also to the food she eats and the environment she inhabits, and therefore it's perfect for the baby because that's the same environment in which the baby's going to grow up. Babies born by caesarean, as you suspect... When they're inside their mum, they're completely sterile. A baby inside the mother has no bacteria at all in it and on it, and it acquires its bacteria only on the way out of the body. So babies which are whipped out via the caesarean route, where you make an incision in the abdomen, you then make a cut through the wall of the uterus, the womb, and you get the baby out that way, those babies are not going to get colonised by flora in the same way as a baby delivered the normal way. So what do they get? Well, people have studied this quite carefully now, actually. And what they have found is that, in fact, the baby picks up bacteria from its immediate surroundings. And when it's born by caesarean, that means it picks up bugs from the hospital surroundings. And babies born that way tend to get a different spectrum of bacteria, at least initially, compared with babies that are born the normal way. They tend to get more, for instance, clostridia for instance, Clostridium difficile, which causes C. diff diarrhoea in elderly people, for instance, they pick that up. They pick up Staphylococci and they pick up Streptococci. So they get a very different spectrum of bugs, which then does eventually change and become more normal and resemble what their family carry. But it still may be slightly and subtly different. And there may also be a longer-term legacy, because doctors have shown that babies born via that route may actually have an increased risk of asthma allergies and diarrhoea at least for the initial part of their life and maybe there may be a lifelong risk of those allergy situations so the bugs you acquire in the early part of your life have an important role to play in educating your immune system and they also protect you from diarrheal illnesses because they keep the bad guys at bay great question though and thank you very much i've got a question for you chris here it's from lauren and she asks why do carnivorous plants eat insects if they can actually photosynthesize Indeed. So they've got leaves, they can photosynthesise, which means they can use energy in sunlight to drive a reaction between carbon dioxide and water, which they get from the air and from the ground, to make glucose, sugar. That's food. So why on earth do they need to catch flies to supplement that diet? What's wrong with that? Well, the point is that plants don't just rely on 
glucose alone. It's a bit like that poster, men can't live on bread alone. <laughs> There's that picture of a beer bottle, isn't there? Plants also need other micronutrients and minerals and things, which they normally obtain, usually through their roots. So in other words, they would put down roots into the soil, those minerals would be drawn up with the water they take in, and they would then be used. Other things like um, proteins and amino acids would be brought in that way, and other macromolecules produced by fungi that plants make associations with in the soil. Um, those are called their hartig nets, their mycorrhizal relationship. The carnivorous plants often live in awful places. Uh, in other words, very nutrient-poor environments where they're very boggy, so most of the nutrients have probably been leached away by water. And as a result, the soil is so poor that many of those trace elements that keep plants growing normally just aren't available in appreciable amounts. So the plants need to look to the air to obtain that nutrition, and they do it by catching insects. Because if they catch an insect, insects have got lots of iron, they've got lots of proteins, they've got lots of other micronutrients in them that the plants have adapted and evolved to make use of and to supplement the poor source of things that are coming in through the soil. And what that means is that the plant can now exploit a niche in the environment that other plants can't. They can grow in places where the competition from other plants for light is really quite weak because other plants can't grow very well. So despite being able to photosynthesise, they've made up for the shortfall in the general other nutritional requirements of the plant by looking to the air in the form of insects that they grab and eat to supplement their diet. So they're eating not for energy, but for fertiliser, essentially. Yep, they're finding their fertiliser from the sky. Yeah, absolutely. If you would like to ask us a question here on The Naked Scientists, it is National Pathology Week, so we're also talking about pathological things, then please do get in touch. You can Twitter at Naked Scientists, scribble on our Facebook Naked Scientists page, or send us an email. It's chris at thenakedscientists.com. It's The Naked Scientist with Chris Smith, Dave Ansell, and this week our special guest, histopathologist Susie Lishman. Dave. Now, predicting how the Earth's climate is likely to change is one of the toughest challenges facing science, one that, as we know, is not without its controversies. To build accurate simulations of the climate, scientists need raw data, and Planet Earth podcast presenter Richard Hollingham has been to Scotland to meet researchers sniffing the air. I've come to a Scottish hillside about 10 miles north of Dundee, and I'm standing underneath a very tall tower. It's actually called the Angus Tall Tower. It's because it's in Angus and it's a tall tower. It's a TV tower covered in transmitters, and we're surrounded by fields of sheep, and behind me, Heather Moorland. And John Moncree from the University of Edinburgh is with me. Now, you're not interested in the TV transmitter. You're interested in the instrument right at the top of this tower, sniffing the air. That's right, Richard. It's, it's not so much an instrument, it's more just a tube. We actually have a long tube which goes from the very top of the tower, which is about 220 metres up, and we sample air down this tube into some analysers which we have in a, in a cabin just in front of us. And what are you trying to measure here? I'm really trying to measure very accurately the greenhouse gas concentrations of the air as the air moves past the tower. So I'm interested in the concentration of the three big greenhouse gases, carbon dioxide, methane and nitrous oxide. OK, so you've got this tube, almost like a hose pipe, I suppose, coming down the, the tower, through this cabling duct and then behind us through this door. That's correct, yes. Let's go inside and see the instruments. Step in here. So you've got a, a stack of shelves with it's a computer on one, a mass of tiny little tubes on the other, and occasionally it's emitting a bit of a, a belching sound. Yes. And, and you're measuring greenhouse gases now. We're trying to build up a picture of how the greenhouse gases change over time in this particular location. And the reason we're on a tall tower, we take our samples from a tall tower, is that the samples that we observe at the tall tower actually reflect what's going on for many hundreds of kilometres upwind. In this particular day, we have a strong westerly wind. So the sample that we're measuring right now will have come probably from Ireland several hours ago. Well, let's have a look outside, because you're on this, this hilltop. You can see the Tay Bridge and, and Dundee. Over behind us, well, there's a transformer buzzing away, this heather, we look west, I mean, you can't see much beyond this hill, but the wind is coming that way, and I suppose it's coming, what, the Northern Ireland, the Irish Sea, Western Isles, Glasgow, and then 
a vast tract of, of countryside and it's hitting here and that's what you're measuring? Well, that's right. We're probably sensing air that's come from Ireland, possibly from the Atlantic. Indeed, there are some days you can actually measure the carbon monoxide that's come off forest fires in Canada. It can come that far and our instruments are that sensitive that we can actually sniff the air coming from a different continent altogether. And what are you finding? I mean, you're, you're presumably seeing a natural process. You're also seeing our contribution, the human contribution to, to greenhouse gases? Well, we are. In particular, we were looking at methane and carbon monoxide to look at the anthropogenic influence. Carbon dioxide is a very interesting gas, of course, because it reflects really what the natural vegetation is doing. So we see a trend in CO2 over the five years that we've been here, but we also see cycles in that trend as well, and that reflects what the, the biosphere is doing, what the oceans are doing, what the, the land surface is doing. But also sometimes if you're looking at carbon monoxide or, or methane, you see spikes or in sudden increases, and they may well be because the air which is coming past our tower has actually gone past perhaps Dundee or Glasgow or somewhere else. Can you give me an example then of something you've seen that you can say, well, that's a result of a particular activity? Particularly on a, a calm, clear night. Perhaps you'd have a southerly wind at this site, and what we'd actually do is we would sniff Dundee, and we'd see that as a, a relatively high peak in our data. And then as the day went on, as, as more mixing came along, that would go away and we'd start to see the natural influence. And that is the point really, isn't it? You're, you're measuring, OK, what's happening now, but you're looking at, at the trends and seeing what is happening to the atmosphere over time. I suppose what drives this, this science really is, where are the carbon sources in sinks? We really don't know where carbon goes once it leaves your tailpipe or your chimney. We know about half of it stays in the atmosphere and about half of it goes in the oceans and the land. So it's a bit like uh, a detective story. We can actually interrogate our data and figure out what the land surface or what the ocean is doing. That was John Moncrief from the University of Edinburgh talking to Richard Hollingham. And if you enjoyed that, there are more of Richard's podcasts as well as links to other Planet Earth resources at thenakedscientist.com slash planet earth. Dave, thanks. Uh, actually, we'll be returning to the theme of greenhouse gases later on in the programme for our question of the week because Diana is going to be asking, what's worse, a volcano or a fleet of aeroplanes? That's coming up and the answer will probably su surprise you, actually. Fred's on the line. Hello, Fred. Good evening, Chris. How are you? Excellent, thank you. How can we help you? Uh, my late wife was 49 years old and uh, very, very healthy, and she died of a brain aneurysm. I would like to know, as soon as the blood vessel bursts, what happens to the body? Right. Well, thanks for that question, Fred. I'm sorry to hear about your wife. My condolences. Well, an aneurysm, as you know, is a bulge in a blood vessel wall. It's a bit like a balloon that blows up and it becomes weak, and so it can burst. And when that happens, blood leaves the blood vessel and goes out into the brain. And the effect it has on the brain depends a little bit on exactly where the vessel is in relation to the layers of the brain. If it bursts into the main matter of the brain itself, then it will destroy that brain tissue. Um, and that would present with somebody having a stroke, for example. Um, it could burst into the surroundings of the brain, the subdural space, and then it can cause an extremely bad headache because blood is very irritant um, and it can cause... Um, pain over the surface of the brain. But when somebody suffers a fatal aneurysm, as it sounds that your, your wife did, um, the blood destroys the brain so that uh, it can no longer make the body function and breathe and somebody would stop breathing instantly because of the damage to the brain. So it's like a large stroke that kills bits of the brain that are essential for life. Susie, thank you. And once again, our condolences, Fred, are on your news. Dave, um, got a question here from Monozuki who says, uh, in summer, air humidity makes us feel hotter because there's less evaporation from your skin when you sweat. In winter, it makes you feel colder. Why is it the opposite way around? I would have thought quite a lot of it is that if the air is very humid, it's also drizzling or something. There's actually droplets of solid water, of solid water in there, so you're skin what so it'll drop on your skin and then they'll evaporate and that will make you feel very very cold i think also i think water vapor will have a slightly higher specific heat capacity it will be able to absorb slightly more um, energy per, per unit volume than normal air actually because it's a more complicated molecule so it can vibrate in more exciting different ways so it can absorb more energy as it warms up whereas yeah when it's warm it's there's if it's very very high humidity 
basically sweating doesn't work anymore because water doesn't evaporate very well and you feel very warm. So on a cold day, if you've got air which has got a bit of water in it and it's cold, you've got to supply a lot of energy to that wet air to make it get any hotter. Therefore, it's always going to feel a bit colder, isn't it, Yeah. than in summer when the water's already saturating the air because high humidity and you're trying to sweat to lose the energy and you can't lose the heat quick enough. So it's two slightly different things going on. And which is course, why you've actually got the, the difference. And of course in this country as well, it tends to be windier when it's wet just because of the way the weather works. So it'll you get the wind chill added on top of that. I think wind chill is probably bigger when it's low humidity than high humidity, but I think it's windier on when it's damp. Kathleen is in Lowest Off. Hello, Kathleen. Hello. And um, now I've got a question. I understand about allergies, how people can become allergic to things as they go along in life. But what I'd like to know is... How can a baby be born that is allergic to breast milk and all forms of milk? What happens? Hello, Kathleen. Well, you shouldn't have a baby that's allergic to breast milk because breast milk has proteins in it that uh, we make in our own body and therefore it's very difficult to be allergic to things like that. Um, Breast milk is a pretty special mixture. You do get babies that won't breastfeed properly and so parents then, in frustration turn to bottled feeds because the baby needs the energy and the baby's not growing fast enough so you put the baby on bottled feeds to try and get the baby growing a bit quicker and then the baby shows an allergic reaction to what's in the bottled feeds and that's because bottled milk does contain cow's milk proteins as you know milk the bulk of what we get in milk is things like calcium plus protein and the body can recognize the cow's milk proteins as being foreign that's one reason another thing that is in milk is lactose and humans have evolved not necessarily to eat milk. And so some people have, especially people who are white and from our bit of the world, actually may have um, a thing called lactose intolerance. And this is where they can't make an enzyme, which is normally expressed in the intestine, and breaks down lactose, which is a sugar. It's two glucose molecules stuck together. They lack an enzyme, lactase, which will break those molecules apart. And so the lactose carries on down the intestine, and it pulls water into the intestine, causing bloating and diarrhoea-like symptoms, and that's lactose intolerance. And people who eat a lot of milk or dairy products, if they overdo it and they have that particular deficiency, will get those symptoms. So that's another reason why a baby might be intolerant. Some babies are just very allergic to things, and some of the other things we were discussing earlier with things like having lots of antibiotics or having a caesarean section can make some people more prone to develop more allergies as they go along. But thank you very much for the question. You're listening to The Naked Scientist. It's Chris Smith, Dave Ansell, and our special guest this week, Susie Lishman, who's a pathologist, and that's because it's the launch of National Pathology Week this week. And uh, if you have any questions for us, you can send them in, tweet at Naked Scientist, or send us an email, chris at thenakedscientist.com. Now, this I'm intrigued by. Dave, you said at the beginning you're going to show me how I can visualise what's on my credit card. Um, Not the bank balance, obviously, but the actual... um, yeah, magnetic information. The... Do you want a card? Um, I've, I've got one myself. I can use yours if you like. Uh, I'll, just to make sure this is a well-controlled experiment, not biased. Here you go. Oh, ha- that hasn't got a magnetic strip. That's no good, is it? There you go. <laughs> OK. Oh, well, that looks very posh. Don't card. wipe it, please. I need I'll that to get best. petrol on my way home. OK. So what we want to do is see what magnetic information is on this card. So we want something which you can see nicely against the black strip of the credit card and is magnetic and is also very very small so you can sense very very small magnetic fields and a good thing for this is basically sandpapered rust so what i've got here is basically a slightly rusty thing you don't want something which is actually falling apart from rust because it'll come off in huge great lumps you want something science just, fashion just sort of slightly in a really brown to sand down. <laughs> it was lying around <laughs> in the garage you know and i'm just going to sand down one of the legs of that a bit okay so the tripod is um standing on a little bit of tin foil and dave is sanding the leg of the tripod and in the sin foil is collecting a big pool of very finely powdered rust and he now has a shiny legged tripod <laughs> shiny air i wouldn't call it shiny <laughs> okay so now just get a little bit of this so what he's now doing rust. is sprinkling some of the products of that rubbing down exercise onto the magnetic strip at the back of my credit card I'll just sort and bizarrely it's sticking i didn't think so rust is excess. magnetic it's not just it's not just metallic iron that's magnetic that's right. It depends on the rust slightly. It's two different types of iron oxide. There's iron 2 oxide, which is a sort of black colour, and there's iron 3, which is a very kind of the, the red colour, which, which you've probably seen before. And the, although what you, the red stuff, the orange stuff, which you can see, is, isn't magnetic, there's probably some iron 2 in there as well, so that will work as well. Um, so if you can knock off the excess 
And if you look at this up against the light, with any luck, you ought to be able to see some lines blowing off the excess of the dust. And what I'm seeing, if I hold this card up to the light, I can, I'm seeing vertical, like, interrupted lines in the magnetic strip where the rust is stuck in some places and not in others. Is yeah, that what I should be saying? That's right, yeah. And the, um, so the, in co the writer has written little areas of magnetic field on the stripe, and then the reader can come along and then read those again later. In fact, if, if you get a slightly better version like I did then, there are two areas. There's one which has got very broad stripes, which will just about have enough data to write your, the, your credit card number. And a second one higher up, which is you probably won't be able to see the difference between the lines. It just forms a kind of constant because uh, they're so close together, which stores slightly more information, including things like your name and your opinion. It looks not dissimilar to a, a barcode, actually, that you might see on a product. Yeah, exactly the same idea. Yeah. So is this this is magnetic encoding of information? I guess you could extrapolate this and say hard disks and computers old-fashioned cassette tapes, that kind of thing. Yeah, and a hard disk works on exactly the same principle. Lots of little areas of um, magnetic, either magnetise it one way around or the other way around, but the density is incredibly high, sort of probably billion, billions of times higher than that. We had, actually had a question about two-dimensional barcodes earlier. What's that? Uh, OK, normal barcode um, encodes information in black and white stripes, and but there's a very limited amount of data you can store because there's not very many... You can't get very many black and white stripes without making your product about the size of the planet. Um, so if you want to get more information on that, you can store the information instead of in stripes, in spots. Um, you can't read it with a conventional barcode reader anymore because it can't just it can't scan across it. It's got to take a picture of it and then decode the picture. Um, but this can store instead of maybe thirty or forty characters of data, it can store up to three thousand, and so you can actually store useful information about the product as well as just an identifier. These days, of course, it's all chip and sin. But there you are. Thank you, Dave, for this week's Kitchen Science. Uh, Alex is on the phone. Hello, Alex. Hi. What would you like to talk about? Um, I was just wondering, um, when you break through something, do its atoms break? Dave? Very good question. The actual atoms themselves, are, it depends what you mean by break, break up the atom. Actually, the atom is made up of a nucleus in the centre uh, with a load of electrons on the outside. It's relatively easy to break ele electrons off the outside of an atom. And sometimes when you break a uh, material, you can, you can rip off some of the electrons on one side and not the other. This is the reason why if you crush things like sugar, sometimes you build up more charge on one side than the other, and then you get sparks going back again, and so you get little flashes inside the sugar. But the actual nuclei of the atoms don't break at all when you do anything like that. You need to do something far more violent to it, um, involving a nuclear reactor or radiation, something f far, more, far bigger and more violent than that. So when you break something, Alex, no, you don't break Atoms in half. You don't create a nuclear reaction. Unfortunately, or fortunately, it could go either way. Susie, this is a, a very good question for this time of year. Um, it actually comes from Max Roberts, who says, where does phlegm come from? Oh, great question. As I'm sure you know, there is a tube connecting the lungs to the mouth, and that's called the trachea. It's the one you can feel if you just feel the front of your throat just under the Adam's apple. That's the trachea. And that's lined by mucous membranes. That's epithelial cells that produce mucus, which is the thick liquid that forms the phlegm. And it has several functions. It's partly a lubricant, so it um, stops the airways from drying out when you breathe dry air in and out. And it also helps get rid of bacteria and things that you really don't want to have down in your lungs. So they get stuck in this sticky um, mucus that lines the airways and then it can be coughed up and keep it away from the lungs. And what happens when you get a cold is in reaction to the extra irritation of your airways, these epithelial cells produce more and more mucus. And when you're fit and healthy, the mucus is normally clear and white. But if you get an infection, it can go yellow or even green as you cough up all the bacteria and the dead cells that your lungs don't want. Susie, thank you. Dave? Uh, I've got a question here for you, Chris, um, from B. Abishek. He says, what is the weight of red blood cells that are made during a human lifetime? Wow, that's a nice, easy question. <laughs> uh, well, I had a look. Uh, the average adult makes 200 billion red blood cells every single day. It's about 2.5 billion every second, which is absolutely incredible because you've got about 20, 30 trillion in your circulation and you have to replace that, um, about 1% of them, every single day. So you kill 1% of them and you make another 1% of them. So it should be fairly simple. You just take the number that get made every single day, you times it by how many days in a year, 365, 
you times that by 75 years in a lifetime, and then you times it by the weight of a red blood cell, and you get the answer. How much does a red blood cell weigh? Well, I had a look for that, and it turns out that the weight of a red blood cell can change across your lifetime. In fact, I found a paper by Mishlinsky and Korshak, who are from Gdansk Medical School, and they tell me that the weight of a red blood cell is about 45 picograms, 45 times 10 to the minus 12 grams in every cell. So if you times all those numbers together, you get 246,375 grams of red blood cells made in a lifetime, which is 246 kilos, or a quarter of a tonne. An absolutely staggering number or weight of red blood cells, just red blood cells to have made in a lifetime. Anyway, on the subject of good questions, time to join Diana O'Carroll for this week's Question of the Week. This week, which is worse, a volcano or an aviation industry? Hello, Naked Scientists. This is Matt from Benoni in South Africa. I'd like to know, if there was another major volcanic eruption, like the recent one in Iceland, what would have a greater effect on climate change? The emissions caused by the eruption or the emissions of the aircraft that were grounded as a result of the eruption? Or would they perhaps cancel each other out? Thanks and keep up the great work. So in terms of greenhouse gases, was Eflayakul a good thing? My name is Pablo Pastor. I'm a greenhouse gas engineer and columnist for treehugger.com, where I write a column called Ask Pablo. So informationisbeautiful.net actually did a great analysis of this and showed that the European aviation industry has about twice as many emissions as the volcano in a regular day. So the volcano has an estimated 150,000 metric tons of greenhouse gas emissions, whereas the European aviation industry has 344,000 metric tons of greenhouse gas emissions. So there's actually over 200,000 tons saved per day by canceling 60% of the flights across Europe. Volcanic greenhouse gas emissions are quite different from human greenhouse gas emissions in that they have been coming out at a a steady state over time, whereas we are now artificially changing that balance so that the rate of emissions versus the rate of absorption has been accelerated or put out of balance. Well, the U.S. Environmental Protection Agency estimates that the global greenhouse gas emissions from human activities totaled 28 trillion metric tons in 2006. So that puts this volcano in in some perspective. In 2008, the greenhouse gas emissions of oil company Chevron and power company AEP exceeded the greenhouse gas emissions from volcanoes in that year. Even an enormous volcanic eruption cannot match the European aviation industry for carbon emissions. It's thought that just over 200,000 tonnes of carbon dioxide per day were not emitted as a result of grounding 60% of the flights in and around Europe. With the volcano emitting 150,000 tonnes per day, it would mean that the volcano is better for the atmosphere by 50,000 tonnes of CO2 per day. On a few bad days, it's estimated that FAR emitted up to 300,000 tonnes of CO2, which would make it worse to the tune of 100,000 tonnes than the flights which would have otherwise been in the air. On the forum, Jessica H added that the ash in the air would decrease the sun's rays warming the earth, so it might have had a cooling effect on the earth. And Sean B said that some of the types of gases emitted by a volcano would be more toxic to human health than those emitted by a plane. But now on to some inactive volcanoes, otherwise known as mountains. Dear Naked Scientist, I am Alex, and I was just wondering, how many more hours of light would you get if you were sitting on the top of Mount Everest compared to someone at the same latitude sitting at sea level? Thank you. Would a day be longer for someone stood at the summit of a mountain than someone stood at the bottom? Send your answers to chris at thenakedscientists.com or write them on the forum, and that's at thenakedscientists.com forward slash forum. Diana O'Carroll, thank you very much to Diana. And uh, incidentally, if you've got a question that you would like dianalyzed, then please do drop us an email to chris at thenakedscientist.com setting out what your question is. That's all we've got time for this week. Next week, join me and Dr Cat who will be at the National Cancer Research Institute's annual conference. That's up in Liverpool. So we'll be bringing you a roundup of the latest news from the world of cancer. And if you have any questions on cancer biology, then please send them in to chris at thenakedscientist.com or you can tweet us uh, at Naked Scientist. Now, we've got a favour to ask you. We've been nominated for the best podcast 
category in the IOP's physics.org awards this year, and we would really appreciate it if you could give us a vote. Incidentally, they do make you register, and we know that this is a big pain, but we would really be grateful for your support. And to make things easy, we've put a link from the front page of our website, nakedscientist.com, to the awards page, so please do give us a vote if you do rate the Naked Scientist podcast. Thank you. Thanks also to our wonderful guests this week, Susie Lishman and Andrew Howard, and our production team, Ben, Mira, Dave and Diana. In the meantime, have a great week and see you next time. Goodbye. The Naked Scientists comes to you from Cambridge University and is supported by the Wellcome Trust, the EPSRC, the Natural Environment Research Council and UK Fast. For more information, look us up online at thenakedscientists.com.